the extraction uh, in with us. Uh, Jonathan Davis joins us. Welcome. Oh, hi. Oh, hi, Danu. Jonathan is a, <laughs> is a wealth manager, an economist who has, um, well, you've, you've, uh, you've edged your way out successfully in Scotland to the point where on your Twitter feed, it says location, London and the South East, <sighs> isn't everyone. So you, it's totally gone. Well, if you listen to the media, everyone seems to be in the South East. <laughs> it all seems to happen down here. Uh, yeah, I, I have very little um, link now with uh, the fatherland, as I call it. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I, I was just talking a couple of days ago, actually. We, we had a fantastic holiday uh, two years ago on the Western Isles. Uh, amazing places out there. Do you know it takes six and a half hours on the ferry to go from Oban on the west coast of Scotland to get to the islands? That's how far out they are. Well, I've stayed in Oban and oh. uh, I spent one or two nights, I can't remember how long I stayed in Oban. Staying at our hotel Hell was Richard Littlejohn. Oh yes, I was sat. I was sitting at breakfast, and I said, "I said, um, I said, this guy behind who sounds exactly like Richard Littlejohn." <laughs> then he said something that clearly offended one member of his party. So was new. And and and, and, and and the woman who who he said it to went, "Richard." I'm like, "Oh my god, it is Richard Littlejohn." <laughs> um, so Open is a beautiful. I mean, it's yeah. a fishing village. Mm. Um, we I remember we had a hire car. We parked on the Pebble Beach, mm. and I was thinking, "Gosh, if this car is there in the morning and hasn't been washed out, and all the other cars were parked there." But I thought, mm. "How on earth do they?" sure that this is not going to go away beautiful part of the world so this is six hours to get to a to an island off open to the west well to get to the you know the islands which go north south i mean they must they must go for about i don't know three or four hundred miles north south we we actually went to the the second most southerly island called barra um a population of about 1200 i seem to recall the most fascinating there are two most fascinating things about barra one that the climate is like north North Spain, believe it or not. Uh, normally it's dry and fine. The second uh, uh, most fascinating thing about Barra, and I believe it's unique in the world, and we watched it happen, the, uh, the aeroplane, which comes, I think, once a day, lands and takes off on the beach. Wonderful. God. That is the air, the, the landing strip. It is cool. It's I mean, that sounds thing. wonderful. Yeah. Just before we, we were going to go to some calls and got some of the stories you've done. Before we do, so Dot, hang on, we'll come to you in a second. What is the reasoning behind the Spanish uh, analogy? I mean, it can't be the Spanish heat. Oh, I think it will be the Gulf Stream. Oh, so you're in the right area. For yeah, the and and they've got palm trees there, uh, and and you know in north in North Spain it's very like desert. Yes, it's exactly the same right across Barra, but uh, it's so beautiful, and uh, I I I can't uh, uh, th- uh, think of Barra without thinking of going to the beach where you can see dozens and dozens of seals popping up like meerkats looking at you. <laughs> It's the most fantastic place. I strongly recommend it. Wonderful. Jonathan Davis is here for this hour. He's going to take some of your calls. We're also talking about the uh, the stories, some of the stories he's brought in. He's here to review the day. Before we start, Jonathan, if people want to find out more about you, how can they do it? They could go to our firm's website, which is uh, jonathandaviswm.com, WM as in Wealth Manager. Wonderful. Uh, pop your headphones on. Uh, mm. Because we're going to take a couple of calls, then we're going to go through some of some of your own thoughts about today. But um, be free to, to to butt in at any time, because you're equal to me this hour. Do- not that you're not equal to me in any other <laughs> state, but particularly because we're here. Uh, Dot is in rain. Evening to you, Dot. Good evening, Jonathan and Simon. Welcome. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. I was briefed by Mel to say hello to both of you. You don't need to say that. <laughs> well, I don't want to come across as rude, do what I? Else, what else is he briefing <laughs> out there? That's what I want to know, because he is the host of the... He says there are some things that are said on the off-air phone-in that, uh, that, uh, that he says we can never broadcast. So I'm looking forward to hearing that one day. Um, punching. Have you ever yes. raised a fist in anger? Um... I haven't ever actually punched anyone that I can think of, apart from maybe my brother when I was about seven, but that was an exception. And he probably deserved it. <laughs> yes, he broke the head off my dolly. Well, there you are, you see. Kicked the football at it and her head flew off and I, I was upset. <laughs> you know, I can remember I was five years old and my eldest brother put my Thunderbird rocket into the fire. Oh, Can you imagine how furious I was? Provocations. <laughs> that was 45 years ago, so I was <laughs> it's still, it's still with me. <laughs> I've been scarred for life. 
<laughs> but you've never, in, as an adult, how do you deal with your anger then when you when you uh, get angry, when you've been insulted well, or something? Not very well. To be honest, I was thinking about this before I got on air. Um, <laughs> I've never, I don't think I've ever actually reacted to anyone verbally abusing me, because it's happened quite a few times. Because oh, I surely work, not. No, all the time I died. No, I work with kids a lot um, in the past, like, quite... Um, unfortunately, I'm not joking about this part, they're quite disturbed kids, and I've also been a play leader in a park on my own, and, you know, had to deal with large groups of kids and on my own, so... I've been through the meal. <laughs> Gosh. And in, but, term, and, it, and in terms of kind of, you, you are able to turn the other cheek, presumably. Well, as I say, when I think mm. about it, when, when it's been verbal abuse directed mm. at me, unless it's like something obscene, I, I'm not willing to take that, it's really. It's very healthy to be able to laugh it off. Well, to be honest, if you work with kids, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself because they pick up on it really quick if you're kind of too stuck up. It's like, ah, we can wind you up really easily. Mm. So you have to be Remain able to Remain outwardly laugh. calm, whatever's, whatever's it, going on underneath. Well, you know, you have to kind of... Um, from my quite a lot of experience of working with kids, I'd say they do want boundaries and they will push the boundaries until they know how far they can do it. Have you had that experience where you, you had to be very careful about how you hide your anger in front of children? Um, uh, y yes. Um, uh, unfortunately, sometimes um, you can't hide it because um, something so awful has happened that you, you blow your top. I mean, not physically, but uh, verbally, yeah. Sounds like you both come at this from a very good place, to be perfectly well, honest. Well, I we think, can learn I think, a lot. Um, sometimes if you... I'm not talking about, obviously, hitting a kid or something, but sometimes I think they need to know when they've gone too far. I don't mean direct your anger at them. The only time... What I phoned about was... Um, because you were talking about the Pope and the fact he mentioned, you know, if anyone cursed his mother or used a curse word, was it, on his, about his mother? Yes, uh, uh, yes, indeed. Well, that's He can expect a punch up. on the nose. Well, that's what I phoned up about, because many moons ago I was on a bus and I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a load of school kids and they were, you know, just, they started off as hijinks and I kind of accidentally got clumped by one of them, you know, jumping about on the seat behind me. And then that started it off because I was daft enough to react. Um, but that kid, I was actually apologetic, but then another one took it on himself to start sort of saying obscenities, basically, about my mum um, behind my back with his little friends all around him. And I just sat there and sat there and thought, there's no point in reacting because there's a big group of them and it'll just get worse. And then he ended up on the bus with all his friends had got off. The one who was, had all the, the, the mouth. Mm. And I thought, right, this is my chance. <laughs> so I got up and went over to him and I got hold of his shirt collar oh. and pulled him up out of his seat. And I said, if you ever speak about my mother like that again, and before I could say any more, a bloke from the back got up and said, Oi, leave him alone. Oh, God. <laughs> and stuck up for him, basically. So I just had to let go of him, which was probably best anyway. <laughs> it, it, it certainly uh, takes all sorts, doesn't it? Yes, and I thought, well, how's he going to learn? You know, it's like you do something, you know, you shout obscenities about some stranger's mother, you get to the comeback and then someone rescues you and says, leave him alone, you big bully. Mm. The, the, the problem is in, in a public uh, mm. sphere like that, Yes. Uh, and of course, they, they, they're not part of our family. I'm we've, not recommending we, it. We've, well, we've got to be very, very careful how we handle things like that. Yes. Um, oh, yes. And, and, and ultimately, um, um, if, if a group of them start acting like a pack of wolves, yeah. isn't it the best thing just to move away, move downstairs or whatever it happens to be? Well, I think it was quite crowded and... Yeah. Uh, it happens quite a lot if you're upstairs on the bus and the kids come out of school, you can get marooned in the middle with, like, fried chicken being thrown over you. And, and you've got to be but, careful because you absolutely don't always know how some people will react. And well, we know of absolutely no. really hideously tragic stories of, oh, yeah, of where that's gone incredibly it. wrong. 
I basically lost it. I'm admitting that I lost it. If you lose it to that extent where you actually go and grab somebody, whether it's a child or an adult, really, but especially somebody else's children, as you say. Yes, you never know. It's, uh, it's not on. To, to end on a happy note, because we, <laughs> uh, we have the international... Um, promoter of haggis in the studio with us on the on the program tonight, um, mm. which is you, by the way, Jonathan. Mm. Um, haggis an unusual. Oh, I gathered that. I have to say, Simon, I kind of got that. It's the haggis spokesman for this evening. Hi, you'll have had your tea then. Oh yes. What, what does that expression mean? I know it's Barry Cryer's joke, but I know I like it, but I don't understand it. Um, well, I think he's getting the point across that he doesn't want to buy anyone any tea. Right, I thought it might be that, but I didn't want to be... That's very good. You know, I hadn't got that. I'm glad you said that's very clever. (laughs) Um, So, are you a fan of haggis? I've never tried it. I mean, I would, I think, try a spoonful just to see, because I've had worse. But um, I've just never actually been anywhere where it's been served, I think. Or I do know a few Scots people, but I've never been around on their Hogmanay or Burns Night or whatever, so... Well, I've never I, actually tried it. I've been listening to the show and I've I've heard that Simon has also never had haggis Ooh, in his never life. Never had haggis. Well, it just so happens what I brought in with me this evening. <laughs> oh, I wonder no, what that no. steaming <laughs> pile was. No, I I I, uh, I didn't grow up in a, a in a, a, a an out and out sort of shall we say Scottish family. Although I, yeah. I grew up in Sc- in Glasgow, and yeah. I didn't actually taste uh, haggis myself. Until mm. I went to uni at about the age of 18. Right. And I absolutely loved it the first yeah. time. And I yeah. love it every single time I have it. And and we, in our family, we normally, in fact, now have a Burns supper um, yeah. at the end of January, February, to celebrate mm. the great man. And, Why not? And, uh, of course, we serve haggis um, uh, on that supper. And yeah. everyone always loves it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I'd try it. I mean, I've, I've had some other. You've had worse, by the way. Strange food. What, what's what's the most adventurous you've been re- regarding food? <laughs> um, I'm trying not to laugh because I've told other people and they just go. Ah! Um, I mean, I lived in France for six months, and the most extreme thing I had there, well, I think, was lamb's brain, which um, <laughs> I tried a teaspoonful of it. And I mean, I really didn't fancy it. But what I thought, is it with well, you and teaspoons of food? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a teaspoon of agus. Much, and much I'll have a... as I'll risk. Uh, no, but the most extreme thing I've ever tried was um, I had a, a neighbour when well, I lived in Stratford who was mm. Zimbabwean, and she was cooking one day in the kitchen. We were sitting having a chat, and she had a big stew on the go, and then she had this little frying pan with something cooking in it, and a couple of us was, you know, nosing about. Oh, what are you cooking, Rosina? And it was for a for a partner. He was like coming home from work. She said, "Oh, I'm cooking them for our Archie's. It's one of his favourite snacks." And he's like, "Well, what is it?" And they were beetles. Oh my word! And um, what well, as in Paul McCartney? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were found in the frying pan. <laughs> and we all sort of went, "Oh!" Um, and then we said, "Oh!" And she said, "Oh, do you want to try some?" So the couple of us who were there said, let's pretend we're on, you know, I'm a celeb, get me out of here, and just try one and see. So it was really hard to actually put it in my mouth. So it was like, just take a quick bite. And to be honest, it wasn't horrible. It was kind of a bit crunchy on the outside and soft in the middle. And it wasn't vile tasting or anything, but it was just the idea, you know. Well, I think you had a lucky escape there, by the way, because that could have been a lot worse than you are describing it. (laughs) Doc, can I thank you for the call? Yes, nighty-night. Good show as usual. Thank you very much indeed. Have a good night. Jonathan Davis is here. Uh, Simon Letterman Show, BBC London 94.9. Jonathan Davis is a wealth manager and uh, and an economist. A couple of quick texts, and I must ask you... Oh, and then we're going to speak to Wiley, and then I must ask you about the state of the uh, our finances in this country in a second. Um, Trev says, it's, if it's not beef, lamb, pork, chicken or turkey, I don't touch it. The thought of eating any other meat makes me feel physically sick, which means I don't see... I don't see... Oh, no, you're okay. I don't care how good it's supposed to be. Illogical, I know, but there you are, says Trev. I think a lot of that makes a lot of sense. Anne says, regarding the Pope, I am a Catholic and I feel very angry that ordinary Muslim people are having their faith and prophet ridiculed. It's very wrong to offend any religion, says Anne. We're asking about uh, the Pope's view that there is a a, a limit and anybody who insults a religion can expect a punch on the nose. Um, Harry and Bromley 
It says, we were sitting in a good restaurant in Sardinia a couple of years ago through the copper plate written menu. We were ordering our going through, sorry, should I say going through the copper plate written menu. We were ordering our mains and my wife asked what was in the house tagliatelle. The waiter looked at her a bit old fashioned and said, it is pasta and horse. Hmm. We then looked properly at the fancy writing and it did say it was horse and not house. I see. Apparently they are keen on devouring donkeys out there too. The only thing that turns me up is fried or soft boiled eggs, says Harry. Hmm. Um, I don't think I would want to try horse um, uh, voluntarily. No, although many of us have involuntarily, Mm. as we know from a couple of years ago. Yes, indeed. Uh, Eileen's in West Dulwich. Evening to you, Eileen. Good morning. Good evening. Sorry, I'm a bit early, aren't I? That's all right. Uh, uh, hello, Jonathan. Hello, good you evening. Sound like, you sound like my granddaughter's husband. He comes from Glasgow. All oh, right. <laughs> yes. He, he must be an exceptional not. chap then. Yeah, well, he was voted top lawyer last year. Oh, well, there's somebody <laughs> yeah. good to have in the yeah. family for yeah. sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, no, first of all, Simon, hmm. um, wasn't that young man interesting? The young man the before the teacher, play, Stalk. He was brilliant, yes. wasn't he? The way he spoke. And, you know, the respect, which just goes to show you, if you start when children are young, you get the respect back. I thought he was lovely anyway. I really did think he was nice. And what do you make of the Pope's comments, which is which is arguably one of the, one of the things he was talking about, actually, in well, terms of uh, the Pope's <laughs> press conference today at the back of a plane? Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm Catholic, but... Um, I remember when he got, you know, was made Pope. Mm. He's, he's quite um, outspoken to other Popes. And um, I just I just laughed when when they explained it about, you know, he didn't believe in it, but if anybody, if that person, uh, you know, made us a remark about his mother, he'd, he'd punch, punch him on the nose. <laughs> I just laughed like I'm laughing now. No, well, what do you mean? I mean, Piers Morgan's written an article in the Mail, and he says regarding the Pope punching. Since when did turning the other cheek turn into punching someone in the nose, in the face, Pope, Pope Francis? Yeah, when do, when's Piers Morgan writing in the in the Mail on a, Oh, you mean tomorrow's book? Yeah, yeah, tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I'll have that. I'll have a read of that because I like Piers Morgan's article. I'll have a read of that. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Now, have you tried haggis, Eileen? Well, just tell you a quick story, very funny story. I don't know if anybody's heard of this. I would like if anybody did if they'd ring through and tell you. There was a place in Northumberland Avenue, in about the middle of it. I don't know if it was a restaurant or a hotel. But my brother-in-law worked in Austria for a little while, and he met these two American, you know, families mm. going to church, and they came over and stayed for, you know, a weekend in London. And uh, somebody told us about this place to take them, and uh, there was my husband and I, and my brother-in-law, his wife, and um, the other two. There was like eight of us all together. So, anyway. When we got in there, the men were all taken away from the women, and we thought, well, that's a build. And uh, when the men came out, we're sitting outside waiting for them, in like more or less in, you know, in the entry to where you go and sit and have your meal. And um, they all come out with, um, uh, what do you call it, kilts on, mm. and the socks. And a dacker down the sock. Oh, gosh. And you could, if you'd have seen him, this Bill was American. He was such a big fellow. He must have been about six foot five. Wow. My husband was five foot, five foot, uh, what was he, five foot seven, I think. My, my husband was short. And then the other chap was in between the three of them. And it always made me laugh when the, um, Ronnie Barker used to do that thing about, you know, I'm, I'm here and you're always bigger than me. That's how they look, like a line oh, going I up. Oh, I know, yeah. Well, and we sat down and they had the, you know, the, um, what's it, the ceremony of bringing the haggis in. And I thought, well, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. So we were all discussing whether we should eat it because the couple, one of the couples, her name was MacDonald. So because she was, you know, really, really, really chuffed about it, especially being an American as well. Anyway, they started um, 
you know, doing all the ceremony over the haggis. And all of a sudden, they cut it. And I thought, well, that looks, that looks like something like um, a, a big, big sausage. So I said to my husband, oh, I'm going to try it. So, you know, we said, oh, we'll all try it. But I rather liked it. I thought it was, I mean, they only gave you a little bit because the time they cut the haggis around and took it all around, it was only just a, you know, taster, but it was really nice. And are you just, last? are you generally quite adventurous with food when you go away? Well, you know what I like, and I've just been trying to think of, and do you know, um, in Spain, what is the food? In, oh, I love it. And there's a place, a fish shop in um Lord Chip Lane that does it, and he does it just the same. And it's um, what, what, what's in it? What kind of food? It's not ravioli. Pa- paella. No, not no. paella. It's oh, I can't think of the name of it. And it oh, I love it. It's really lovely. But most restaurants you go and they don't. It's not the same as eating it in the Spain. But in this fish shop in in uh, Lord Chip Lane, they re- and. Unfortunately, I don't go down there now because, you know, I can't walk about mm. a lot now. Mm. So I can't go there. But it, that is lovely. Well, memories, very good memories. Listen, I need, if, if Eileen is giving a recommendation to Haggis, and I thoroughly recommend we all have a go, if possible, even if it's the vegetarian version. Eileen, thank you very much indeed for the call. Can I just say about my memory of the sky? Yes. I went, we went to Sky on holiday... Have you been to Sky? I oh. have been to Sky. It's a f- also oh. a fantastic place. Oh, what a gorgeous place. Mm-hmm. But we went on the ferry before they had this bit. Well, we went quite a few years ago. And we stayed. And as we were driving, we went by car with my brother and all and sister in from Canada. And as we were r- driving along, Jonathan, all the hedgerow, all the heather was all changing colour. Oh, wonderful. And it was the most gorgeous yep. and we stowed in this small, small hotel which was absolutely six class it was the the ladies the waitresses were all in those long long aprons like they wore years ago with a bonnet the ruffled mm-hmm. bonnets on mm-hmm. bonnets on there which hair. which year were you there Oh, I can't think. It must have been 40 years ago. Gosh. Happy memories of Sky. Thank you very much, Lee Darling, and have a wonderful evening. I went to Sky. I've been to Sky once because a friend of mine who I work with here lives in, has family who lives in Sky. And um, when we went to stay up there, I, I arranged a place to stay, a, quite a relatively decent B&B. And I rang them up and I said, can you recommend somewhere to go to eat? And they recommended this place. And I thought, gosh, this is odd. Everyone seems to know everything. And so we turned up at the B&B and this lady served us and helped us and whatever, whatever. And she said, uh, I said, well, do you know where this place is? This is a place that I've been recommending. She said, oh, yes, um, it's so-and-so, so-and-so, da 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 Anyway, then we turn up there later. She's working there too. <laughs> she, everyone works everywhere. Uh, 11.30 is the time. Simon Letterman Show, BBC London 94.9. Jonathan Davis is here this hour, wealth manager and economist to review the day. Uh, more of your calls, emails and texts to come. Before all of that, Colleen Harris has the headlines. London's news, I'm Colleen Harris. Two suspected jihadists have died and a third has been arrested in a counter-terrorism raid in the town of Verviers in eastern Belgium. Officials say the suspects opened fire on police and were planning to carry out a large-scale attack imminently. It's believed they had retu- recently returned from Syria. Gale Force winds have reignited a fire at council offices in Oxfordshire that were hit by a suspected arson attack. A huge fire engulfed South Oxfordshire District Council's premises in one of three fires in the early hours of this morning. A 47-year-old man is being questioned by Thames Valley Police. Property developers have been criticised for promoting the sale of a block of flats in one of London's most deprived areas as without social housing. More than 30 flats in the nine-storey Abbey Tower development have been put up for sale in London and internationally. The absence of social housing is being sold as a perk. Greenwich, Greenwich Council has condemned the advert. And a business standing in the way of Tottenham Hotspur's £400 million stadium redevelopment plans has launched a high court battle to stay put. The owners of Archway Sheet Metalworks on Paxton Road, Tottenham, are challenging a compulsory purchase order. 
A look at London's weather now. Breezy with some scattered showers at times. Winds easing after midnight, though, with lows of 0 degrees Celsius. That's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. BBC London 94.9 at the weekend. At least there you go. It's going to be a good partnership. We agree on what we yeah. don't like. Yeah. Now that's all that's going through my head, though. Yeah. Sunday mornings with Tim Arthur and Harriet Scott. How lovely to be speaking to you on your new programme. Good morning and welcome, Tim. Sunday mornings from nine. And all you need to do is open the lid and place your face within the box. <laughs> that... Using your jaws. You're not a Frederick. dog, though. Frederick, You're not a dog. A... Tim Arthur and Harriet Scott. Ali, where do you stand on the banana front? My thing on the banana is which end do you open? Sunday mornings from 9. Tell you something, it's too refreshing to hear a programme that's talking some sense about diet. BBC London 94.9. Morning. Morning. Is it you? We'll get better at this. Call 020 722 4000. Text 81333. Start your message with the word London. BBC London 94.9. Simon Letterman Show, BBC London 94. But I'm Jonathan Davis is with us this hour. We're taking your call through until two. Jonathan is only here with us un, uh, until midnight. I know there's a lot of things you wanted to talk about on the programme tonight. Before we do, though, before we go through some of your stories and uh, some more calls, we should talk about money and particularly the way that the financial situation in the economy uh, is affecting us. And we've heard all kinds of things that have recently happened. We've, we've seen um, things in uh, in Switzerland uh, we've we've obviously got concerns about Europe. We know we've got an election around the corner here. Um, what is what have we got in store? Do you think this year? Um, you, you, before I answer, but you you say um, how we're affected. I, I, I would say the last uh, six seven years since the two thousand and eight uh, recession, um, the top five percent have been absolutely laughing. Roughly the next thirty five percent are doing okay. They're they're working hard but they're they're doing very well. That means as far as we can see, the bottom sixty percent uh many Hello. Well mm, uh, that's debatable is uh, okay. Um are, are struggling. Yeah. They're working hard, they're running fast to get nowhere. And um I don't necessarily know about twenty fifteen as you ask. But going forward over the next few years, I can only see, unfortunately, more of the comfortable 35% moving into the bottom chunk, the bottom bulk. Um, I just see that as a society, we're getting poorer and poorer um, and the cake may be getting bigger. In other words, we've got some economic growth, but it's all skewed to the very top. The people at the bottom, and, you know, the bottom, as I say, is already six out of ten of us, um, are not benefiting at all. And, given and unfortunately, this is world, that's going to increase. Given this is worldwide, not just in this country, what is, what is allowing that to happen? Um, we're misallocating whatever scarce resources we have. In other words, um, we're handing it to, to banks. Um, we, we've, in the last six, seven years... Uh, globally in the West, we've handed them um, 10,000 billion, that's 10 trillion dollars, pounds, whatever. Um, that's a misallocation of resources. So that's why more is going to the top than going to anywhere else. It, it, it's not as the, the Church of England people uh, said today that we need to focus more on the poor. No, we need to focus less on the rich and therefore the pie will be shared more equally generally. Wonderfully, uh, wonderfully concerning, but hopefully at some point that may well change. Um, <laughs> uh, just, just, just some of the. Uh, we'll do a couple of your subjects in a second. I'll just do a quick text if I can. Tracy Ann in Crayford says, I am half Scottish and I love haggis. Here, here. As do all my family. I grew up in Asia and have eaten many strange things, such as shark fin soup, snake, and deep fried spiders and crickets. Apart from the spiders, I love them all, says Tracy Ann. Thank you for that. But has um, she had deep fried Mars bars? Ah, ah, or yeah. a fish supper. <laughs> uh, this is uh, on the text. I eat a 
McSween's haggis with mashed potatoes once a week. Do you know McSween's? That's not a brand I'm aware of. Okay, no. I get them from Waitrose. They are great. I urge you to try them and not to dwell too much on the ingredients. Mm-hmm. I do have a very Scottish name, but please don't read it out. I won't. But this may have something to do with it. Oh no, this 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 may have nothing to do with my liking it. Um, thank you for that. Um, and um, Paul says. Please tell Eileen from West Dulwich I'll take her to lunch in Lordship Lane. She knows me, so it won't be a blind date. I'll pick her up in a taxi and I'll pay. I'm only five minutes up the road from her. This is Paul in Crystal Palace. Thank you, Paul. Um, Robin says, brains are yummy, as are sweetbreads and all awful. Pigs fries, which I can't say what he's describing them as, but I think we kind of know which bit of the pig they're from are delicious haggis as i was led to believe are just the sheep's stomach filled with oats and barley where have i gone wrong livers etc says robin the only thing i'd say about haggis is everyone who hasn't tried it is turned off by the ingredients and and yet when you think about it many of the uh, dishes that we eat um there, there are strange things put in there but ultimately it's all from an animal isn't it um, or indeed vegetable, because uh, they, they, mix, they mix it in. Um, I would say to someone approaching haggis, forget what's in it, just put your teaspoon, as Eileen would say, <laughs> she's got a whole collection of them, hasn't she? <laughs> just dip your teaspoon in and and uh, scoff away. It's the most delicious, rich, um, uh, uh, all-encompassing taste. It just... it it, it, it um, awakens your senses, your taste buds. It's a beautiful taste, um, and I cannot recommend it enough. Do either of your two favourite supermarkets stock it? Here's the clincher. Here's the clincher. Uh, I, I, I believe they certainly do, and the fact is we're approaching Burns Night uh, already. It's it's the 25th of January, so go go to the local supermarket, um, but buy a, 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 a little... Uh, it's like a, a an oval. It's, a, it's like a very small rugby ball, isn't it? Uh, just go and buy it. It's dead easy to cook, and it tastes absolutely delicious. Carolyn says M and S sell it. Have done for years, although usually in the chiller cabinet. This section at uh, this time of year. Make sure you cook it along with the nest. Need some tatties for full effect. Alternatively, there must be a, a restaurant somewhere in London that serves it for Burns Night. Go with a Scot for the best effect. Says um, says Carolyn. Thank you for that. If anyone, in fact, can get themselves invited to or buy a ticket to an official burn supper of, of something like the Rotary Club or um, uh, the, the, I, the, the, the Tory Club or the Labour Club, something like that, those are tremendous evenings. And if you can get Highland dancing going as well, and a wee Kaylee, a Kaylee going, I just oh say Kaylee. my god, they're fantastic fun. <laughs> and then of course you get the wee drams afterwards. Yeah, or indeed before, <laughs> if, if you want to get me doing a Kaylee. Ali says it's a commonly believed myth in Scotland among family that uh, haggis have one leg shorter than the other <laughs> so that when they run along the side of the hills, they stay upright and don't fall over. They love telling that little secret to the English. You know, I remember hearing that and thinking, oh, so that's what a haggis is. Um, yeah. Mark says, I may not have travelled, but I will try any food that is served up. And uh, I've not had a haggis for a few years, so I may be uh, tempted to try one again. Mm. He's looking forward to you on the show because he sent this before you came in. Thank you much indeed, uh, Mark. Mm. That's um, nice. Now, um, you mentioned briefly about this story of, of, of the archbishops commenting that low earners are being left behind. Tell us mm. the detail of what they said. That um, uh, the South East is taking off, it's taking more um, o- to go back on what I said earlier, it's taking more of the pie that there is, so the people in the Midlands upwards um, are getting less of a share of the cake um, and uh, the poor are becoming poorer because the cost of living is rising while uh, earnings or benefits are not. Um, and that, of course, is factually correct. But their answer is that we need more socialism, that we need more taxes, that uh, we, we need to uh, actively take from uh, uh, those who are uh, either working hard um, or, or who are running businesses uh, uh, and have wealth. Um, we should take from them and hand them to the less well-off. Well, I would suggest uh, to those uh, bishops that that's actually the, the, the reason why we got into the position that we're in. Um, and it's fascinating that they're talking about taxing more 
uh, and spending more on the poor, in other words, increase socialism, when in the uh, in South America, in Venezuela, which is which has been a socialist nirvana for the past uh, uh, several years, uh, that country is an absolute meltdown, and with no exaggeration, this is a country where um, uh, they are literally queuing to get bread and milk because the economy is in meltdown because of uh, dreadful Marxist and socialist policies. And what's so funny about that? Because the archbishop in Venezuela is criticising the government for their socialism. So in, in Britain and in many other Western countries, the, cleric, the clergy are saying we need more socialism, but when there's actual hard socialism going, the, the archbishop knows that it's a nonsense what we need is to uh, bring back a thing called capitalism. And what do I mean by that? I mean we need to get the government to stop interfering in the economy, stop interfering in markets. For example, um, help to buy is a thing we've talked about many times. Um, All that does is it it gets uh, people involved in housing, so they borrow. And who does it ultimately benefit? It benefits the people who are already in housing. In other words, it benefits the wealthy. So if you took away help to buy, house prices would fall. And you know what? The people who want to buy property would be able to buy it, but by borrowing less money. And uh, those who would lose out from it, would be the rich. You're welcome to react to what Jonathan is saying. Just lastly, before we go to some callers, um, how do we force ourselves into the top 5%? Well, um, there, because of successive governments, it's, it's increasingly difficult for um, uh, th- those who um, are in a certain strata or, or an income position to move into the next level um, because the government... Um, is constantly putting up barriers for advancement. As I say, in 2009, uh, in Britain alone, they handed nearly a a, a thousand billion pounds to the banking community. And who did they take it from? They took it from everyone else. So uh, I guess ultimately we we need a different political system whereby um, we'll actually not bail out failed businesses, as in banks, using other people's money. Instead, when businesses go bust, they go bust. And that way, the cost, a uh, uh, few steps later, the cost of living would fall uh, and uh, business costs would fall. And that is how we will get more equality in the system because people, uh, people's standard of living will rise. And um, those of us who are entrepreneurs and running our own businesses, we will be able to compete against the large multinationals. All right. Jonathan, thanks very much for that. Um, Hillary's in Yule. Morning, evening to you, Hillary. Hello, Simon. How are you? Very good. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that explanation. I mean, I think that's helped a lot with us being able to understand a bit more about the financial situation. How has it left you feeling, Hillary? Pardon? How has it left you feeling? Well, I don't know, you know, because talking about, I think you said the bottom 60% are running hard and getting nowhere, you know, and I think that's very sad, isn't it, at the moment? But uh, It's very sad indeed, and uh, I, I, I don't, this is, my, this is um, the depressing thing about it. Yeah. I, I don't see it changing. I, I think the general election in four months' time will be a massive red herring because um, for, for decades we've had one party or another party, and when you think about it, um, the, the, on the big picture, and I know uh, uh, people will throw their slippers at the radio now, yeah. but uh, on the, the big picture, they're actually in agreement. Uh, they're, agreement they're agreeing on the EU, they agree on high borrowings, they agree yeah. on high taxes, they agree on high spending, they agree on low interest rates, they agree on bailing out the banks. Who was it that bailed out the banks? It was Gordon Brown. Yeah. Uh, 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 the big picture, actually, the politicians are in agreement. Yes. Oh, it is quite worrying, I think, you know, but uh, we'll have to see what happens. We want a few more women involved in the elections and saying... Well, come on. Bit. Come on, then. Uh, I will. <laughs> but um, uh, that the wasn't Pope. really what I was going to No, talk you want to talk about. about the Pope? Yes. I mean, I think uh, I like him, you know. I'm not a Catholic, as you know, Simon. Mm. I'm a Church of England. 
But I think he's bringing a sort of a lot of fresh air to the Catholic faith or to faith in general, I think, with what he comes up with, you know. The, the idea of, if you I get... Ins- I've not heard of a Pope who was talking about punching noses. Well, this is a question. The idea that if you get insulted <laughs> that you're going to punch someone on the nose. And he says that's normal. I mean, have you ever <laughs> raised your fist in anger? Uh, no, I must say, you know, I'm being an oldie. I don't think I've ever punched anybody. No. I mean, I probably might have sort of punched, you know, the, the seti or punched something else, getting mad about something, but I haven't punched anything. And, Jonathan, it's lovely to have your accent mm. because I think what's so wonderful about these aisles we live in is that everybody comes from a different part and we all speak differently and we've all got different accents and it all adds to the richness of this wonderful nation. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I I just find it fascinating um, from, from an intellectual point of view that um, I, I left Scotland 30 years ago, but I've still got my accent. And I don't understand how that can be. Why have I not got the accent of people um, in, in the southeast of England? I, I just don't understand it. Well, that's funny because I come from the Midlands originally, and there's a couple of words that I say in some way that makes my little grandchildren absolutely rushing around laughing. <laughs> the way I say singing and something about hanger that you hang things on, you know, but apparently I say it all different to how they say it. Mm. Uh, but anyway, yes, so I think, can I say something about women scientists? Yeah. I'd be interested just, to know, Jonathan. I was reading. Well, hang on, long... let, me, let me just say, so the reason why we're talking about this tonight is that there's an article, an article in, the, in The Independent saying that women are less likely to become scientists because of a misconceived idea of brilliance. Um, So they're taught, this is women, to believe that these professions require innate intellectual brilliance, i.e. you're born with it, rather than sheer hard work, which is, I think, what women believe is the right thing to to get on. This, not my thoughts, these are the thoughts of these academics who've carried out this research, and they suggest that there's a misconceived idea that brilliance is holding back girls from taking subjects like physics, engineering and maths in favour of what they describe as softer subjects like humanities, languages and social sciences. Yeah, well, this just echoes something because, you know, Simon, I'm a optimist, mm. you know, with the large women's organisation, and we had a conference in Nottingham not long ago, and there was a brilliant young woman, I can't remember her name, who was earning a fantastic salary, and she is a scientist. And she says that there aren't enough girls that are going down this road. But the difficulty is you've got to have two science subjects and maths. And it's a proven thing that girls aren't so good at maths as boys are. Apparently, mm. that, that is prov- be- hang on. That is proven in what way? I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose they've proved. But she said we must encourage girls to take up the scientists because you see, we would we're apparently very good at it because mm. we can multitask. And that's very useful in the scientific field. What about Carol Vorderman and Rachel Riley? Pardon? What about Carol Vorderman and Rachel Riley? Yes, but I mean, they're, they're exceptions, aren't well, they? Well, are they? I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't think... Uh, I mean, I felt I was reasonably bright, but I don't think I was terribly good at maths. But uh, I did ask the question because of my nine-year-old girl, you know, uh, my granddaughter I live in, you know, next door mm. to now. And she said, yes, you have got to have maths, and that is more difficult for girls, but that we should be encouraging them to go forward and do it because there's going to, there aren't enough scientists around in the evolving sort of world we're living in at the moment. And the, the, girls this, would be very good. Well, this is something that I, I, I do actually know a little bit about, although I'm not a scientist, it's just uh, general reading. Um, it, it was quite interesting that it was two years ago that actually in the UK, um, UK students um, was the first time that more than 50% um, of science students were in fact young women. Oh, good, yes. Um, I think um, it, it, it's not so much an issue that w- we're not getting uh, girls to study sciences at school and then go on to further education. I think the issue is that um, um, the, the jobs that um, you would naturally move into with a science degree are very male-dominated and ultimately, it, it, it's um, uh, it, it's 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 going to therefore, um, as with many 
uh, such activities, it's difficult to get on uh, 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 if, if you're the one who stands out. And that is probably more more the problem. Um, but uh, I, it, I do not believe that it's 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 certainly not an issue of their academic or uh, capabilities. Yeah. On the contrary, uh, I, I found um, uh, uh, that uh, that women are eminently and probably more capable uh, on the average at the sciences and maths than 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 boys. And, and certainly uh, over the decades, we've found that uh, boys have just not been applying themselves at school as much as as girls do. Oh well, that's encouraging. Isn't yeah. It? It, the, the problem is when you get into the big world, that's when, unfortunately, it's a male-dominated world and it's really difficult for women to get on. To get and on. that's the great shame. Oh, well, that's, that's something we'll have to be lobbying on then, And obviously. very briefly, a quick word, if you can, oh, Hillary, haggis. on haggis. Yeah, well, I love haggis, actually. Yay! Yay! And, and also, I mean, because I've travelled the world, as, as you know, Simon, a lot in my voluntary work, I've eaten all sorts of things. I bet you. What's the most adventurous... Well, I don't know. I think it's the good old things I, you know, as I'm an oldie, as you know, but all the things I used to eat in England as a child in the country. You're a brave woman. No, no, but I mean, brains and scrambled eggs is delicious. <laughs> and my butcher in Newell, he can't sell me brains now, he tells me. No, gosh, well, I... Too. Well, there we go. Well, I'm, I'm, I admire what you do, Hilary, and in certainly what you eat. Can I thank you for the call? No, well, thank you, and thank you, Jonathan. Nice to have chat. Lovely to speak with you. Filling in the financial picture for us. I have a greater understanding now. Thank I'm, you. I'm glad you have. Um, Kit's in Hackney. Evening to you, Kit. Yes, hello, Simon. Hello, Jonathan. Um, hello. A couple of questions for your guest. Um, one is, if he thinks uh, the government shouldn't intervene in business, does he think, therefore, that the Scottish oil fields should now go under since the price of oil is no longer enough to keep them afloat? Um, in, in a free market world, um, supply ultimately would meet demand. Yes. S so um, if... Um, so you wouldn't support the oil fields now that they're no longer uh, viable in the free market? Um, it... it, it when it comes down to it, uh, that that is essentially correct. But uh, right. I, I, but okay. you'll but you'll find that um, the the businesses will not shut down in the North Sea, um, uh, because uh, uh, to to one hundred percent because some will still be needed because we still need oil. Yes, and secondly, you know you're you're talking about the socialism in Venezuela. And, and, I mean, uh, where you have too much capitalism, you need some socialism. And where you have too much socialism, yes, you probably probably need some capitalism. Wh and the reason is... the bishops are saying we need some socialism here is that we've been overly uh, capitalised and commercialised uh -huh. for the last 30 years, whereas Venezuela is in the opposite direction. So both are, you need both, don't you? Um, well, th that that's a, that's dependent upon your definition of capitalism, and I fully understand I'm, that most people see the bailing out of banks as capitalist. Actually, it's exactly the opposite. Um, it, it's fascist. It's Marxist. What it is not okay. is capitalist, because in capitalism, those businesses went bust. They should have been not. They should not have been bailed out using other people's money. OK, but do you, do you believe that, they're, they're, that, that, that uh, you know, good management is about a balance of rather than being too ideologically leading to one way or the other? It's all about common sense and well, balance. Well, Would indeed, you agree? Well, indeed, we should all, always use common sense if only there yes. was some in the Houses of Parliament. Well, you could only achieve that by, um, by having well-paid um, politicians who are free from lobbying and mm. can be independent. Well, I, I don't think... And you have a free vote. And, um, yep. A coalition government, free vote. It doesn't matter who puts the policy forward. Uh, no whipping. I let every MP uh, in the land uh, vote on each policy as a free person. And, and that way you can start getting some common sense in, our, in the way we govern ourselves, I think. Well, those are some good suggestions. Um, do, you, do you feel you. positive for the future, Kit? I mean, we were talking about the top 5% and then the 35% oh. below them. Um... I've been, I, I, I've, I've learned to live on such a low income most of my life that uh, whether I'm uh, positive or not doesn't revolve about being wealthy or, or money. It's about whether people appreciate me or not. Uh, unfortunately, not enough of pre people to appreciate me. So you can't, you can't live a, on appreciation, even if, even if millions of people appreciated you. 
Yeah, but you can live on thirty-five pounds a week. So um, can you? Well, you can you can pay your bills and live on fifty-five pounds a week. Ah, oh, once after that. bills, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, with bills you can live fifty-five pounds a week, can pay your bills and feed you. The problem are the rents, and that is what is crippling our nation that we have allowed the rents to become so high that your unskilled worker, your chambermaid, your post office worker, your taxi driver, your road sweeper can no longer afford to pay his rent and the taxpayer has to pay the landlords instead. To which I would say for the last uh, 20, 25 years in particular, the government has intervened, Both all governments have intervened so much in the housing market that has created this extraordinary situation that uh, house prices in London are about 20 times earnings. Rents take up a vast amount of people's net take home. Yes. If the government would just get the heck out of the housing market no, no. and let the market uh, do its own thing, I tell you, rents and house prices would be a great deal lower and the the state would not have to pay that housing benefit. Last word, Kit, 15 seconds, then we're done. I don't believe that for a moment. I don't think they've intervened enough, to be honest. All right, well, we'll we'll have to continue that another night. We haven't got time, but thank you. It's an interesting point to end on. Kit, thank you, actually, for that. Jonathan, thank you for coming. It's very good to see you. My great pleasure. I've enjoyed Once it. Once again, if people want to find out more about where they can get haggis close to them, um, they probably won't find it on your website, but give us <laughs> details of, of how they can get in touch with you, should they wish. Um, they'd be welcome to look at our website, which is jonathandaviswm.com. Uh, Robin says, and who was the advisor to Gordon? Brown, Messrs Miliband and Bulls. Vote Labour and there goes the economy along with the rest of your pension, says Robin. Uh, and uh, Eileen was trying to think of not paella, which I thought was a very good mm-hmm. intervention from you, but it was calamari. Oh, was of course, of. right. Ah. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Lee, to you all. Calls continuing until two. Simon Letterman Show, BBC London 94.9. One minute to midnight is the time. And Colleen Harris has the headlines on the way next. <laughs> BBC London 94.9. The latest travel news. Well, we're still awaiting recovery at the moment in South Ryslip. Uh, no change for us on the eastbound side of the A40. Uh, we've still got lane one of three closed off at the moment to assist with the vehicle that's broken down. A complication with recovery there at the moment. Still awaiting that. Uh,